start with Dr. Michael Bellin, who's going to be teaching us uh, how to diagnose keratoconus, tried and true versus new views. Thank you. I am a consultant for Oculus and of, of Vidro. So I was given the title, and when I was first given this title, I was honored to speak at Cornea de Jennifer. However, I gave it some thought, and I really thought, you know, this is a stupid title you gave me. Tried and true or new view. I have no idea what you really meant. So I'm guessing tried and true is supposed to be placebo-based topography, and new view is supposed to be tomography. But if you really think about it, some type of tomographic imaging was available since 1989. It's not exactly new view any longer. Now, I realize many people persist in using what's tried and true because there's some comfort with familiarity. And what was good in the past isn't necessarily good now. As I said, there is some comfort with familiarity. But you have to realize, and this is, shouldn't be discussed any longer, placebo-based anterior analysis is an outdated technology. And it really is time that we abandon that ship. Because no matter what improvements are made, you're still using an outdated technology. So what are the limitations? Most of us know this already. So all the prior imaging devices were just limited to the anterior surface. They did not measure the posterior surface. They didn't take in consideration the negative power contributed by the posterior surface. And if you don't measure both anterior and posterior surfaces, you can't generate a full pachymetrical corneal thickness map. So why do you need tomographic imaging or tomographic analysis? Well, we need it for refractive screening. We need it for toric IOLs. You heard again, often used for keratoconus. We need it for post-refractive IOL computations. And particularly, we need it for cross-linking. Three of these, at least, are relevant for keratoconus. Well, how about refractive screening? The main use is to identify susceptible individuals that otherwise would be missed. And we call this subclinical keratoconus. Don't confuse this with suspect or suspicious. This is true disease. And I'll show you examples later. We also need to know the true thinnest point of the cornea to do true residual bed and also PTA computations. So what is subclinical keratoconus? It's true disease again. The corneas are abnormal. You have an abnormal posterior elevation. You have an abnormal pachymetric progression, but a normal anterior surface. So the patient still retains good vision. Based on placido alone, these patients look normal, and they have normal vision. But they have true disease, as you can see here on a better close-up. A normal anterior surface, but a definitely abnormal ectatic posterior surface, and an abnormal corneal thickness map. For those familiar with the Bell and Ambrosia display, you can see here a highly abnormal cornea. This is almost six standard deviations outside the norm. But notice this column. This is the anterior values, all completely normal. Subclinical, normal vision, true pathology. Also, if you're relying on a placido instead of tomographic, then you have to use ultrasonic pachymetry for your corneal thickness. And single apical readings lack sensitivity. Single apical readings also convey very lit limited inf information. Corneal thickness at the thinnest point is a much better single point screening tool. And this is some work that's actually nine years old that we published back in 2008. We looked at over 1,200 in individuals that were previously screened as completely normal. So normal pachymetry by ultrasound and normal placido. And we looked at how the thinnest reading compared to the apical reading. And in patients that were previously screened, we had values that almost approached 100 micron difference. That means your residual bed computation can be off by nearly 100 microns. That means your PTA computation can be off by a huge amount if you're relying on apical readings as opposed to thinnest point. Additionally, if you can measure the anterior surface of the cornea and the posterior surface of the cornea, you can develop a full corneal thickness map. And this is some of Renato's work who you heard talk at the last session. And this is a graphic representation of the pachymetric progression. In other words, the speed at which the cornea changes thickness going from the thinnest point to the limbus. The value of that is shown here. These are two corneas with identical apical readings, so the same ultrasonic pachymetry. The one on the upper left is a normal but thin cornea. You can see a normal tracing right down the middle. The one on the right has the same ultrasound reading, but notice a highly abnormal pachymetric tracing. Thin but normal, 
thin, the optimal postoperative result requires full anterior segment analysis. That means being able to look at the posterior surface. Here's some two quick, quick examples. Here, identify when you have significant change prior to visual loss, which is what we, really we should be doing. In light of all this, however, I realize many physicians still rely solely on anterior curvature analysis. And could that many physicians be wrong? Thank you.